the requirements of the, the Sermon on the Mount show us how the Old Testament expectations of the law should be fulfilled in believers under the new covenant that was inaugurated by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can think of Jeremiah 31, 33 that speaks into this, where it says, this is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now it is the Holy Spirit who does this, of course, and it's only by his work given giving us the new desires of our heart and empowering us to overcome sin and temptation, that we can even begin to strive to live up to the holy standards that we see in the Sermon on the Mount. We see the Sermon on the Mount as a number of things. It's a code of godly living, of course, for followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a stark contrast between God's kingdom values and the world's values, and it's a contrast with the superficial faith of, of the Pharisees and perhaps we could say today's equivalent as well, and that of truly born-again believers. And the Beatitudes show Christian character and the metaphors of salt and light relate to the influence of that character in the world, the influence we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ should show. The Beatitudes are progressive and they're interlinked with the first one relating to a, a person's helplessness before God. Let's read verses 1 to 3 again together. Now when he, that's Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he went up onto the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now this refers to those who are under no illusion that they fall way short of God's holy and perfect standards and need his forgiveness and reconciliation and are humble enough to confess that before God. They acknowledge, we acknowledge our spiritual poverty and our utter helplessness to make ourselves right before God. And by saying theirs is the kingdom of heaven, I think Jesus is saying there the door to God's kingdom is, is wide open to such as these, but not to those who are proud and think they're good enough for God, just as they are. Let's move on and look at verse 4, where it reads, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And this refers, I think, to two interrelated things. Firstly, for the sin in our own hearts, an awareness of how far short we fall of from God's perfect standards. And, and Grant prayed into that in his prayer a, a few moments ago. Uh, but secondly, it's a mourning also for, and a deep sadness for the many manifestations of sin and of evil we see in the world around us. We just need to turn our TVs on for the news or radios on to, to see that. From an individual perspective, it would, we could say it's a simple but necessary step from confession to contrition or repentance. And just as Jesus wept over the sins of, of many others, so Christian believers should also show a deep sadness for the sins of others, whilst not hypocritically, of course, forgetting our own fallen nature, not being judgmental for who are we to judge. And this is progressive, and it occurs in increasing measure as by God's work in us through his, his spirit, we become more and more sensitive to evil um, in, the, in the more subtle and finer ways, I guess. And as mourners, we delight and give thanks for the promise that we will be comforted. And what does that mean? Well, I think it's as we, we know both peace with God and peace from God, but also as we look forward to that glorious eternity where sin will be banished, evil will be banished from our own hearts and all around us as well. And a person who's genuinely poor in spirit and consequently mourns for the sin in their own heart and in the world cannot be proud or boastful, or should not be proud or boastful. But rather, as verse 5 tells us, they'll be meek, and as Jesus says, such will be blessed. 
Meekness, of course, isn't weakness. Often it's confused as weakness. It's not. It's possessing a true humility and a gentleness of spirit. And it's not necessarily thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves left less often, but also thinking of others more, perhaps more than we do. And as meek Christians, we rejoice that we will inherit the earth, the new earth, of course, in the, the glory to come. And the spiritual progression continues through the Beatitudes. Folk who confess and repent of their sin and desperately sad at the sin in the world cannot be unchanged by it these things. It leads to strong desires to see change both in ourselves and, of course, in the world. In other words, they should, as, as verse 6 tells us, uh, refers to rather hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus tells us that such people will be filled. Hungry people need to be filled, of course, with food. But through faith, believers are justified that is counted innocent and, and made right in God's sight by uh, the one-off work of Christ on that cross. We have his righteousness, and we could call that salvation past. But as already mentioned, God by his spirit begins and continues a transforming work about in us to bring about a transforming righteousness, his inner righteousness. And we could call that salvation present. And it's part of what being filled means, I believe. But we mustn't forget the eternal perspective to its fulfilment, when in the eternal glory, as I've already mentioned, we'll be completely free from the presence of sin in and around us. We could call this salvation future, and it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed to all who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus, and I'm speaking to people maybe watching online now or at a later date in the week, then speak to someone here about that. Pray to God, ask him, help me to believe, Lord, forgive my unbelief. Nothing, nothing is more important than knowing Jesus as your Lord and your Saviour. And for believers, these things should lead for, to a desire for righteousness in the world as well as in our own heart, the world around us, and for us to be agents of righteousness, looking forward, looking ahead now to being salt and light. This is a living righteousness, being as Jesus commanded, salt and light. Verse 7 tells us that the merciful will also be blessed by being shown mercy. In many instances we see, sometimes on the news or in different contexts, where people have had wrong done to them, we often see hatred and a desire for revenge. But God's ways are different truly countercultural. For we who've been shown such mercy and benefit from such great mercy must also show mercy to others, and we should desire to do so. This is part of the new nature in Christ, and by God's transforming power resulting from surrendered lives to Christ, we can do this consistently, regardless of the personal cost to us. And it relates to showing kindness to others, love in action, showing the fruit of the Spirit we read about in Galatians 5. And God sees such individuals who show these qualities as pure in heart. The next beatitude in verse 8 in our passage, <coughs> excuse me, where Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And it, our inner eyes are more and more open to see the glory and beauty of God. And of course, this doesn't relate to perfection, this side of eternity, but to the attitude and the direction of our hearts. As we seek, however imperfectly, to imitate Christ, the Prince of Peace, so we too should be peacemakers, moving on to the next beatitude in verse 9. For when we possess both peace with God and peace from God, we should naturally, supernaturally perhaps, seek to be agents for peace in this world, even if it, again, even if it brings trouble and suffering to us, as it often does in a world that's largely hostile and rebellious to God and his ways and his people. And as true peacemakers, we'll be called, as Jesus said, children of God. 
And this is another example of how true, true children of God should conduct themselves in the world. Let's move on then to the last two Beatitudes in verses 10, 10 to 12. If you could turn to your Bibles and we'll read these together. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. A double beatitude here on the theme of, of persecution and the opposition that we can face. And Jesus tells us that those who are persecuted for righteousness and because of him have the kingdom of heaven and can rejoice and be glad because great is their reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The words in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you reminds us that as followers of Jesus, as God's children, we are successors of his faithful servants all through history to this very day. To be persecuted for righteousness sounds perverse, really. Why should, for doing right, why should we be persecuted? Um, but it's what we should expect from a, a rebellious world whose values are diametrically opposed to those of God, to God's kingdom values. But of course, it isn't all bad news in that respect. For as we seek to show the love, the goodness, the truth of God and proclaim the life-saving, life-transforming gospel through verbal and visible witness by what we say and how we live and the examples we, we set, some people will be drawn to Jesus and believe and be saved. Others, maybe they don't believe, but can be positively influenced for good, is being salt in the world. Um, and there are many scriptures that talk of persecution and how we should respond to it, including to what Jesus told us a little later in chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, where he said, we're to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us, that way we may be children in heaven. Or in other words, this is how his children should behave. How very different to the world. The Beatitudes, the whole Sermon on the Mount, and of course the Gospel is, to use that phrase again, truly countercultural. Let's look at what it now means, sorry, let's look now what it means to be salt and to be light in the world. As we look outwards and we see the evil abounding in, and in its many man manifestations in the world, we can think, what on earth what sort of influence can the likes of those described in the Beatitudes have on the world? What influence can someone like me possibly have? Will we not just be overwhelmed by the flood tide of evil and opposition? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't share such a bleak view, uh, a bleak outlook. He didn't, he didn't say you must seek to be salt and seek to be light in the world. He said, you are you, me, you are salt and light in the world. And of course, he was referring to believers all through the ages, to us to this day. The Lord Jesus, who said in John 8, verse 12, I, I am the light of the world, is telling us we are the light of the world. We are now to shine with his light. He tells us this, because as we read in a number of places in New Testament scripture, that we are now his body his representatives on earth. And in line with this, or linked to that, uh, from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, where we read that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Through us. And Jesus told a ragged bunch of relatively simple, uneducated, common men who lacked, at the time, spiritual understanding, and who at the time of his betrayal, his arrest, his unjust trials, his crucifixion, denied him, abandoned him, hid away. He told them, you are salt and light of the world. But of course, we know then post-resurrection and post the filling of the Holy Spirit, 
at Pentecost, they set the world on fire with the good news of salvation, the gospel. And the church grew and spread, first to the Jews, then to the Gentile world. And it grew despite the fires of persecution raging in the early days of the church and throughout the ages to this very day. Persecution, the fires of persecution raged to this very day, yet the church grows. And yet we can sometimes despair when we look at the seeming decline of the church in the Western world, maybe even our own country, and the compromise, maybe sometimes the outright apostasy of parts of the visible church. But in many countries where persecution rages, the church is growing. You could think of Iran, sometimes referred to as the fastest growing church in the world. Now, that's not an easy place to be a Christian. You could name numerous other countries. So when we think of those early believers we read of in Acts and their amazing missionary work, let's remember again that we here, this ragged, ragged bunch of believers, are their successors, as I said earlier. So what do the metaphors of being salt and light actually mean? Firstly, Jesus, most importantly, is indicating that the church, his true church, uh, and the world are distinctly different communities. In recent times, maybe it's been fashionable in some Christian circles to, to blur this distinction. But this is serious error. We are different. Salt, as we know, it's a common everyday commodity then as, as now, with two main uses, to, to enhance the flavour of food, a seasoning, I guess is the right word there, but also as a food preservative, particularly for meat and fish, to prevent decay. Grant and Claudine probably know about that with dried meat uh, in South Africa called biltong, yeah? Um, so salt has those uses. And light, of course, is needed to dispel darkness. Light and darkness cannot coexist in a sense. And light allows folk to see where they're going. It allows them to walk on that right path when it's dark around. And we, but we know that due to sin entering the world and affecting every, every individual, the world is decaying. It cannot help but do so. And sin breeds sin. Uh, unchecked, sin will breed sin. And due to the breaking of the relationship with our Creator God, the world is in spiritual darkness. It may talk about its enlightenment, but much of its light is simply just darkness. I think, I'm probably going to misquote this, but I think Paul Mallard last week um, talked about philosophy or philosophers. Some of you might have better memories than me, so correct me if I'm wrong. I think he said something like, philosophers are a, a bunch of blind people searching for a black cat in a dark room, or a, searching for a black cat that doesn't exist in a dark room. Um, I thought that was quite good, actually. Always searching, never finding, because the world is in darkness. So God's children, that's us. God's children have the role of hindering the spiritual and moral decay in the world by the example of living obediently and in truth and in sacrificial service. And we have the responsibility of shining light into where there is spiritual darkness that people may see and hear and respond to the truth that sets them free, the gospel of Jesus. And being salt and light, as I mentioned earlier, relates to the influence of believers, the influence we should have in the world, both individually and, and of course, collectively. As, as uh, Mark spoke this morning, this isn't, our faith is not individualistic. Yes, it is in one sense, but we are the body of Christ. We have to work together. So how do we act as salt and light? How do we shine as the light of Christ? Um, it is, of course, seeking opportunities to share the gospel uh, with whoever and whenever we can. But it's also showing how the gospel has affected us, um, every part of our lives, by numerous ways. And I, this isn't an all-exclusive list, but it's certainly showing love, mercy, kindness, patience with folk, both verbally and practically. It's going the extra mile sometimes, being willing to be inconvenienced. It's certainly being generous with time, 
with money, with energies, with skills, and with knowledge. And it's being willing to serve those that others may avoid in the world. Think of a mission at Lansdowne Church and numerous other churches up around the country that reaches out and serves in practical and spiritual ways the homeless of Bournemouth. That's just one way of being salt and light. And it's also setting a good moral example in, in our behaviour by having our moral compass fixed unwaveringly in the direction of God's truth and righteousness as well. And it's showing those that we interacted that we have different priorities. We live under a different king. And in doing this, we should be looking for opportunities, of course, to explain why do we live like we do. It's unflinchingly speaking the truth into lies, and it's speaking against evil. But of course, doing this with respect and with gentleness and love, of course, without being critical, without being judgmental. It's hating the sin and the lies, but loving the sinner. That sounds a bit cliched, but we'll use it anyway, because it's true. These, these words were attributed, I think, to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and they speak powerfully into this. He, he thought he said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. I don't know about you, but those words always pull me up short. For I know there's been times when I should have spoken out, but I remain silent. May those times become less and less and <laughs> non-existent. This Christian pastor certainly knew what it meant to stand against evil in Nazi Germany, for he paid with his life for his uncompromising Christian witness. Uh, as many in the world are today as well, paying with their literal lives, um, their mortal lives, of course. And we can think of numerous believers through the ages who've been effective, sold, uh, and shone brightly with Christ-like night. Probably one of the first names springs to mind, a lot of, peop a lot of Christians' mind will be George Wilberforce. Uh, his work, along with many other Christians, for abolishing slavery. But he did much else besides that's a lot of people are in ignorance of. There was George Brew, founder of the Salvation Army, that did amazing work in his time and still does. Elizabeth Fry, who was appalled at the prison conditions for women in particular, but in general, and, and just worked tirelessly to change things. Uh, Sir George Williams, heard of him? No, founder of the YMCA. In his day, the YMCA also did amazing work. Um, shining light into darkness. There was George Muller in Bristol who set up orphanages for children that otherwise would have just neglected. I think hundreds if not thousands of children came under the power of the gospel but also shown love and compassion and helped in the practical way. Um, there's quite a few Georges there. To be effective salt and light, you don't have to have the name George, by the way, or Georgina. Um, there's probably, and there's numerous more I could have chosen, but, and more seriously, we don't have to match those, the feet of such individuals. There are numerous ways you and I can be salt and light to influence society, and, and never think anything is too small, too insignificant. Numerous ways, I'm not going to cover them all by a long, long way, but it could be explaining to others at work, perhaps, or in social settings, why you don't do the lottery because you trust in God to meet all your needs. It would be contradictory. Great witnessing opportunity to use. Um, it, it's being honest, trustworthy, and reliable at work. Um, probably embarrassed Rosemary now, but she used to work for, I won't mention the department, but a big department for a lo Bournemouth local authority. Her boss, decent man, I, I, I know him myself, or have met him, seen him for ages now, but he said to her one day, you know, I like, I like having Christians work under me. Do you know why is that? He said, because they're honest, trustworthy, reliable. Wow. You know, a lot of the time those Christians probably wouldn't, realising what an influence they were having, but they were. They were. And she had many conversations with him, gospel conversations as well. So one thing leads to another. <clears throat> 
And of course, it's through a church's ministry, like, like us here, through all sorts and Right Steps and Kids Club and the Hope Explored courses we run from time to time and many other ways too. But to live like this, individually and in out there in the world and collectively, we need courage and we need wisdom. We certainly need a knowledge of God's word as well. And we obey and delight in both the commands and the promise of Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6, which I'm sure many of you could quote at me, where it says, um, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean upon your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight or direct your paths. And we must also help, support, encourage, and pray for one another to live like this. This is a key aspect of what being part of a living church is. So what helps us to keep salty and our light shining brightly and invisibly? It's simply knowing and living obediently in God's will for the lives of his redeemed children. And we find his will, of course, in his word, in the Bible, in the teaching on godly living that you'll find at the end, the second part, if you like, of Paul's letters. Read the book of James for an amazing um, instruction on practical holy living. But of course, let's look at the supreme, perfect and supreme example in the, the life and the teaching of Jesus, the eternal Son of God. So let's not neglect reading and rereading the four Gospels too. So much of Scripture can, can help us in this. And it's been said before, but I think a really, really good spiritual habit is to pray on Scripture. Because it's, I think Paul Mallard touched on this last week, it's like a mirror. It simultaneously shows us how we should be, what we should be like, but then reminds us what we are really like, um, that we fall short a little bit. It's not like the mirror that evil queen used in uh, Snow White used, where it would always tell her lies. Scripture is always honest to us. When we read about the high standards of holiness and godly living that our Heavenly Father expects from his children, we realise we invariably fall short of this. So pray on Scripture that you read. Ask God by a spirit to help you, to be obedient to it, to transform you more and more into the likeness of Christ. And he will do this. He will do this. Most addictions are excuse me, usually bad and in some cases very, sadly, very bad indeed. But it's no bad thing to be addicted to God's word. But with a proviso, I think, but only, only if we come to it reverently. It is, after all, the very word of God. So we come to it with a genuine desire to know, to understand, and most importantly, to continually be transformed by it and to live obediently to it, not just read it for knowledge's sake alone. As we come to a close, we cannot ignore the warnings that Jesus gives. We must not lose our saltiness. For Jesus warns us that such salt is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by people. Nothing more than road dust, we could say. How do we lose our saltiness? Well, another example in the light of what we've just been looking at is neglect of God's word. Technically, salt, sodium chloride, I, I'm led to believe, is a very stable compound that's resistant to most attacks. However, it can be contaminated, polluted by other substances. It can then become useless, maybe sometimes even dangerous. And so importantly, if we're not being filled with the truth, the teaching and the instructions of God's word, they're not just being empty space in our hearts, in our minds, but the toxic beliefs and values of the world will seep in. And there's a danger we become like a, a rudderless ship on stormy waters, unstable, without a true bearing. And in a similar vein, we can lose our saltiness by contamination with, <coughs> with the world's values and beliefs by deliberately, or sometimes thoughtlessly, allowing the world to impact us by some of the people we mix with, or the things we do, or go to, or 
even things we watch on screens or read, some of the things that can contaminate, can contaminate us may be actually quite subtle. But maybe the, the more subtle things are the more dangerous things because they sneak under the radar, as it were. So we must be aware. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 15, we're warned not to love the world or anything in the world. Now this warning is about not loving and being ensnared by the godless values and principles and behaviours of the unbelieving world. But we are commanded by Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, to love our neighbours or sinners, our fellow sinners, we could say, and even to love our enemies. So we don't love the world's systems and behaviours and values, but we are to love the people, the sinners. Much, sorry, more and more of society is pressuring us to keep our faith. In, we see this in the UK and the Western world. More and more of society is pressuring us, pressuring us to keep our faith and our biblical truths very private, very personal, not something to be shared. Yeah, you, you'd be okay if, if you do that. Just don't broadcast them. But we cannot hide away from the world. We can't retreat into nice, safe holy sanctuaries. For how could we love our neighbours if we did that? So we mustn't be cowed into retreating. To do so would mean direct disobedience to the Lord Jesus. We'd simply be concealing our light. Or to use the other metaphor, we'd be keeping our salt in a salt cellar, where it would have no effect at all. So we need protection, and of course God's protection is available, including as fallible people, we must exercise wise and spiritual discernment, the wisdom God will give to those who ask, to know and avoid the places, activities we perhaps shouldn't attend alone, if at all, especially things we may be personally more vulnerable to. We must be aware in Christian work there may be some things we shouldn't do alone, but with an appropriate co-worker or workers, and we should learn what it means to wear the spiritual armour that's spoken about in Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. And importantly, we make ourselves accountable to one another within the, the local church. We should view the things we watch or read through a biblical filter. And we are to bring everything we do to the Lord in prayer, which of course is to acknowledge him in all our ways. And we know the promise he will then direct our paths. And just one more reminder, of course, to feed regularly on God's word. Um, and in all these things, we need the support, counsel, and import importantly, most importantly, the prayer of one another, just to reiterate that point. As Christ followers, and hopefully Christ proclaimers, we're not just individuals, but parts of the greater body of Christ. This is what part of what Mark talked about this morning. Each part, each person has a part to play towards our common mission to glorify God, to proclaim the life-saving, life-giving gospel, and to make disciples of those who come to faith. So we must not conceal our light, but in God's strength, be bold and courageous and shine with the light of Christ. We mustn't let our soul become corrupted, polluted, be good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. For who wants to be nothing but road dust? Salt and light, Christian character, Christian influence. And being salt and light is part of obeying Jesus and denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following him. This is what, what he who gave up everything for us expects of his disciples. And so we obey and we encourage one another in this obedient living, even though at times the going will seem tough. There may be a temporal price to pay. It will sometimes seem like we're swimming against a strong tide, but we press on because God spoke, as God spoke to Joshua, he still speaks to us, encouraging us too to be strong and courageous, for he will never leave us nor forsake us. And we press on because the victory has been won at Calvary. And we have an eternal inheritance that can never perish, 
spoil or fade. Kept in heaven for us. Kept in heaven for you. Amen.